Gospel of Jesus according to Matthew. So, what is the theme of this gospel? I mean, of this uh, narrative? Jesus is the King of the Jews promised in the Davidic covenant. It is the bridge between the Old and the New Testament. It is a brief history of the life of Christ. Presents the birth, ministry, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, before I read any more, I, I, I need to share with you this context. Why is Matthew important? How is it relevant? And why is Matthew put in the being the first book of the New Testament? We just read, it is the bridge between the old and the new. So for 400 years, it's been so silent. No one heard anything from God. But now, Matthew, a tax collector, was called by Jesus. And he found the truth. He knows the truth now. He knows salvation now. And so, you know, what is the burden in him? Imagine you are a Jew and you probably like the rest of the Jew wait for waiting, you are waiting for the Messiah. And now you know the truth. Are you going to keep it to yourself? No, right? You you want to share, you want to tell all the people in, in Israel, look, I found the Messiah. He, he is Jesus. And I want to share with you all that our life depends on, our hope is in Him. But it's a major, major task. You follow me? It's a major, major task. Because these people, these stiff neck people from before the exile to the exile and after they come back from exile, they were still going through the motion. Remember, they were more interested in building their own house than building the temple. They were more interested in doing their own thing. And, and they were not really, they go through the motion, they come to, the, to the, 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 the temple to worship, but their heart is not there. And then here comes Jesus, and Matthew got saved. In a very short word, he got saved. And so if it is in his heart to want to share this, so... What I have, Matthew, Matthew is a tax collector, so he knows the number, very careful person. So, what I have uh, are the Old Testament scriptures. You follow me? And what I have here are these ignorant people. These are the Jews. And Jesus had always said, if only they had known, but they don't know because they don't know the scripture. So these people, they are my target audience. I need to tell them. But if I come and tell them, I found the truth. I met the Messiah. Well, what talking you? <laughs> On what basis? What evidence? So, in order to validate what I'm going to tell them and convince them, I need to connect the past with them. You follow me? So, I, I want to come, I'm Matthew, I want to come and tell these people, hey look, it's not I say, it's what the Old Testament, what the Bible say, the, the, the Old Testament say. So that's why he went through, first he started with genealogy. He tell them the history of who he begot, who, who begot, who, who begot, who, and so on. It, I know it's boring, but to the Jews it's important. So I tell you, oh, okay. So if you link all this uh, to David, okay, we know God promised a Messiah to David. And then you link all the way to Mary. Oh, okay. It, it sounds a bit more uh, realistic, more believable. And then as he went on, he said, okay, this was mentioned, written in the Old Testament, and I show you now, it is fulfilled. And then another one, and then another one. So he had to bring so much of this Old Testament to present as evidence like in a court 
you present all your evidence to persuade the judge. And so, you presented all this, then, oh, okay. I believe. And so, this is not exactly a very easy task for Matthew. Look at you and I. We try, now we have the whole Bible, we are more equipped than Matthew. You try and bring this, you go and evangelize. Not easy, right? But still, he did this. And so, these are the Jews. His target audience is the Jews. And the Jews are waiting for the Messiah. And they know the Messiah is not going to be someone called a Gentile. You understand? Waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah must be a Jew. That is their belief. And it is true. So, if I were Matthew... I cannot come and say, present me, this is the king of England and he will be your Messiah. Throw me out the window, you understand? <laughs> so I must present, which is a fact, I present that indeed he is the Messiah and he is the king of the Jews. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So he presented to them, king of the Jews. And to the Jews, as I mentioned earlier, that the genealogy is important. If you go to Israel and you go to those places of worship like synagogue and in the past, in the temple and so on, they do record because when the child is born, on the eighth day, the child has to be circumcised for a boy, for a girl, no. And then they register the name. And they can trace the name throughout Throughout, you know, so you think, Leong, 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 Adam Leong, you know. <laughs> so they can trace all the name. And to them, that is really important. Until today, they, they still they still keep track of their family history, their genealogy of all the people throughout the years in Israel. Now, for the Jew, okay. You want to convince me that this Jesus you talk about is the king of the Jew? Simple. Because when God started the nation of Israel, He started with who? With who? Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, He called Abraham out of the land. Out of the land of Ur. Yeah. And then told Abraham, through you are all nations will be blessed. Those who bless you, I will bless them. Those who curse you, I will curse them. And so that started, he's the father of Israel, so to speak. And he's the righteous one. I mean, the faithful one. I mean, So, started from Abraham. So, first of all, you've got to convince me, Matthew, you've got to convince me uh, that he is a Jew. That he comes all the way from Abraham. If he comes from someone else, uh, then always like that. Secondly, as a Jew, I know that God promised a Messiah who will, he will raise through the line of David. Not Solomon, not, 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 so, someone, not any other king, but through the line of David. So you must convince me that first he has his roots all the way from Abraham, and then he has his roots all the way to David. Means from Abraham through David, and then, I believe you. So you must satisfy these two criteria. And that's what Matthew endeavored to do in the first part of chapter 1. He put us through the genealogy. Genealogy means the genesis. It means the origin to trace. Now, in the four narratives of the gospel, how many genealogists Least thing did you find? How many? Matthew is one. And the other one? Luke. Luke chapter 3. Uh, Mark got no genealogy. John got no genealogy. And then you read Luke's genealogy and Matthew's genealogy. Eh? Look quite the same, but also not the same. Yeah? This one we got who, this one we got who, and this one put the father of, the father of, is it the son of? So, a bit different, but we settle that one later. But right now, I just want to 
ask you why Mark got no genealogy and why John got no genealogy? Huh? Okay. Matthew, Matthew was pre presenting Jesus as the king of the Jews. So if you want to tell me he is king, then I want to make sure he has got royal blood. You can prove to me, link to Abraham and link to David. So that's why must have the genealogy. Mark presented Christ as the servant of God. A servant got no status. I really don't care which kampong and where he comes from, which island. A servant got no status. So why, why even try to show me the genealogy? So in Mark, there is no genealogy. In Luke, Jesus was presented as the, as the son of man. Son of man. So, if I want to prove to you he is the son of man, that means he is not God, but he is also man. Jesus is God and he is man. So you prove to me that he is man. Okay, then you must show the genealogy. So show again the genealogy. In John, Jesus was presented as the eternal son. Theological. Eternal. In the beginning. That's why he had to go all the way back to the beginning, right? In the beginning. So eternal, that means from everlasting to everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting. How do you come up with genealogy? You can't. It's too much because it's eternal God, eternal Son. So no genealogy. So now you know why these two gosp uh, these two narratives got genealogy and the other two do not have. I'm quite chummy. I haven't started this one. <laughs> but interesting. Uh? I hope so. And I tell you, this wasn't mentioned 12 years ago. <laughs> Anyway, so, point number five, this gospel is characterized by the high level of Old Testament citation which seek to prove that Jesus fulfills the long-awaited expectations of a Jewish Messiah. So what this is saying is, that's why there are lots of quotes from the Old Testament in the gospel according to Matthew. To this end, the initial sentence gives us a clue to the content of the gospel, the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, or the Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. This is verse 1, we will do that later. And five sermons, this I mentioned two years ago on, at, the, uh, at the pulpit. The first five chapters of the gospel according to Matthew were written so that they are quite similar they identify with the first, with the five books of the Pentateuch. so for the jew to because the jew they only read and memorize and meditate the Pentateuch, the five books genesis exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy they are very familiar so if matthew can start his book with uh, an analogy with a parallel to the Pentateuch, it would definitely win their interest. So, Matthew chapter 1, he starts with Genesis. It is like the Genesis, the first book of the Bible. So, chapter 1 is likened to be the Genesis of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2. Exodus. Why Exodus? Because Herod, the king, was so threatened by the news that there is the birth of a king that he wanted to kill. He wanted to find Jesus, but you know he wanted to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. In fact, he, when he did, he killed all the kids below one and a half years old. So he had to run away. Ran into Egypt. Okay. And after that, after this, this um, uh, uh, Herod died and then the son took over. The son was also evil. So they ran out of Egypt and they went up to Nazareth. And that's why 
they say he shall be a Nazarene. So, Exodus. And then when you come to chapter 3, chapter 3, Jesus was water baptized, right? Was water baptized, right? And then when you go to Israel and you want to be baptized, I tell you the meaning of immediately. <laughs> You, 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 know, you know, you read that uh, uh, Jesus went into the water and uh, immediately he came out. So for the longest time, uh, most people don't understand why they went immediately. We were baptizing, I was baptizing them in winter, it's cold. <laughs> so I said, can you quickly come in and quickly go out? <laughs> immediately, otherwise it's so cold. <laughs> okay, anyway. So, but John said, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. But Jesus said that all righteousness be fulfilled. To fulfill the what? The law, the requirements. So it is likened to chapter, to the third book of the Bible, which is Leviticus. The law, the instructions. Then when you come to chapter 4 of Matthew, Jesus, after he was water baptized in chapter 3, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert, right? Into the wilderness. And he fasted 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, the devil tempted him. But he was in the wilderness. So when you study the fourth book of the Pentateuch, which is Numbers, it numbered the people who were going through their journey in the wilderness during the 40-year stay in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So it's likened to that. Then when you come to chapter 5, you find, in fact, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, that is the record of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gave the, 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 the power, the most powerful sermons, the sermon at the Mount. And, and we were there, Sermon on the Mount. And so he detailed all the constitution, the do's and the don'ts and, and so on. And it was quite lengthy. If you read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. Again, a repeat of the history and all the things that God had instructed Israel. Why? Because the first generation that came out with him from Egypt, they all died in the wilderness for lack of faith. They dare not go. So God said they will not enter the promised land. But the new generation, that's why they were there for, for, for 40 years in the wilderness. And by then the new generation, led by Joshua. So in order to prepare them so that they know the history before they enter the promised land, <coughs> Moses gave, delivered the second giving of the law. So he repeated all the history. Mm -hmm. Lengthy. And that is likened to chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. So this this will definitely draw the interest of the Jewish reader. Oh, okay. I can identify with that. And in this book, it is not dry. It is going to be a very interesting read because it is communicated to us in words and in deeds. So not what Jesus taught or what he spoke, but also what he did so that it will interest the Jewish reader. The key verses. Here you find in Matthew chapter 12, Verse 23. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Could this be the son of David? All the multitudes. So they were curious. So they have heard him. They have seen uh, his ministry. So they asked, Could this be the son of David? Because David line is supposed to emerge a Messiah. So, this means that Matthew was doing his job by trying to bring all of this to 
a, 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 a decision that these people could make to know that this is Jesus, the Messiah. And of course, we know Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This one, I will elaborate when we get to chapter 28. Now, this next part, the quote, you will find very uh, occurring frequently in the gospel according to Matthew, that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken by the prophets. And Matthew, is he wrote this to authenticate what he has just uh, reported. Okay, this happened, but this was to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet. So to draw the Old Testament out to validate whatever happened now. So direct quotations from Old Testament, there were 29 and indirectly there were 121 uh, references. And uh, he also quoted not just, I mean he quoted from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah. All this. These are noted and known prophets of old that the Jews are familiar with. Then we have the birth. Okay. Uh, in, in this outline, uh, in this outline, the book, this book is divided into four sections. But later, I like another one which has got five sections. But if you like this, these four sections are the birth and preparation of the king, chapters 1 to chapter 4, verse 11. Then you have the great Galilean ministry of the king because he spent most of his ministry up in Galilee, in Capernaum. And then he returns to Jerusalem, chapters 19 to 20. And finally, the final week of the king in Jerusalem, 21 to 28. Now, in this uh, narrative by Matthew, you will find this very uh, commonly used. Kingdom of Heaven. And Kingdom of Heaven is only found in the book of Matthew. Not anywhere else. Because el elsewhere, they use Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Now, Kingdom of Heaven is in simplicity the kingdom the kingdom of God on earth. That's what some some scholars wrote. But I I, I think I think because um, Matthew was writing to the Jews. I know the Jews uh, will not even spell I mean the name God uh, is like so sacred and holy. So, um, instead of using God, even today you read literature, you read writing, they put G and then dash D. They will not spell, the, they don't think they are worthy to spell and to call the name. So, he used Kingdom of Heaven. And let me tell you, many scholars uh, use interchangeably Kingdom of God, Kingdom of Heaven. They are equivalent. But if you want to look at the diagram, you look at the diagram, so overarching, that means the overall one, of course, is kingdom of God. And He created the heavens. So, He also, God also rules and reigns the first king, heaven, second heaven, third heaven. All. And of course, the church comes there in the center we are under okay? so we have the kingdom of heaven above us and overall is the kingdom of God so when you read elsewhere you will not find kingdom of heaven except in this book of Matthew still on the introduction you have I, I, I thought I, I, I give you some definitions. 
uh, before we get started. In fact, we haven't get started. This is still the introduction. <laughs> the Pharisees. Now, you you need to know uh, this. Pharisees. The Pharisees are in short, they are like the religious policemen. They are the legalists. They are the conservatives. And they do go about policing and to ensure compliance. Hey, you walk too much on the Sabbath. You carry too much. And and you are you, you are not fulfilling this requirement, you are you are you are, you are unclean. The Pharisees arose to defend the Jewish way of life against all foreign influences. They were strict legalists who believed in the Old Testament and who were nationalists in politics. So, they believed in the Old Testament fully. In fact, they even added a few more. Uh, the, the, the laws and so on. And they're nationalists. That means they really defend their zealots. I mean, they really defend, they stand up for the country nationalists in politics. So these are the Pharisees. The only thing Jesus was not pleased with them is, well, you are good with uh, your compliance, but you know, you, can you show some mercy? Can you show some mercy? Mercy and grace. They don't, they are, they are so stickling, I mean, sticklers to, 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 to all the requirements. So they are the conservatives. So in politics, if you at one end you've got conservatives, the other end you have what? The liberals. Mm. Anything was okay. So those are the Sadducees. You know how you so the Sadducees are they are so liberal, they don't even believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in miracles. Uh, so they try and explain the way. So how to remember them is set no see or sit set to see or something. <laughs> Sadducees. The Sadducees were made up of the wealthy and social minded who wanted to get rid of tradition. Yeah, we are Jews, yeah, we, we do some, but tradition, tradition, let's get away from tradition. And, and today, today, even in the church, we have people who are quite liberal. It's okay, God, God. Uh, love, love, uh, 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 is love, God will forgive, so LGBT is fine, abortion is fine, I mean, and, and, and uh, uh, this and that. So they are the liberals. So they are the wealthy and social minded, so they do have some influence. They sit in, in the right places, in the right seats, and, and uh, uh, they have got influence because of their position in society. They rejected the supernatural and were opposed to the Pharisees who accepted it. The Pharisees accepted miracles because they accepted the Old Testament. <coughs> and the Old Testament were miracles, right? Elijah, Elijah, all were miracles. But these Sadducees did not accept. So they and the Pharisees are always opposed to each other. But do you remember when they had a common enemy, they came together? <laughs> and who was the common en enemy? Jesus, wow. when they want to put Jesus down, then two of them came together and conspired. Sad, right? The Sadducees were closely akin to the great Epicureans. Okay, next we have the scribes. So these are the people who will painstakingly write and copy the scriptures and so on. And they know the scriptures. But whether they do anything about the scriptures or not is a separate matter. When we come to Matthew chapter 2, I will show to you, they got knowledge but no action. So, they were a group of professional expounders of the law. So they can write and they can teach. The Pharisees, only police. Uh, but these are the scribes who write, write the scripture and they can teach, they expound that stems from the day of Israel, they became hair splitters and were more concerned with the letter of the law than with the spirit of the law. And sometimes it really gets to you when someone is so stickler, such a stickler to the letter of the law. No grace, no mercy, not in the spirit. But these are the scribes. 
I think three years ago we went to Masada. We we met one scribe where he was writing. He even wrote a, a, my name in Hebrew for me. <laughs> Herodians. Then we have the Herodians. Now, during Jesus' time, there was a Herod the Great. In the early years, Herod the Great is a great builder. He built the Masada. He rebuilt the, the temple. He rebuilt the he built the aqua, aqua duct, whatever, out into the sea at, at, at the Caesarea and so on. Great. But he is also a very cruel man, which I'll explain when we start. He uh, killed his wife, killed his children, and, and so on. So, there are followers. I mean, until today, there are people who follow Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. Nazi, they still... How evil you are, sure got some followers. So there are this bunch of Herodians. Uh, they 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 have they are like a political party, and they want to resurrect the power of the days when uh, Herod the Great was. So the Herodians were a party in the days of Jesus who arose as political opportunists, seeking to maintain the Herods on the throne, because after Herod the Great died, the his empire was divided into three, I think. Then he got one he, one son take the north, one take the center, one take the south. So the Herodians, uh, so when you read the Bible, then the gospel, then you say, hey, Herodians, who are they? They, they are trying to uh, uh, retain and maintain the power exerted by the the, the king Herods, whether the father and the, or the sons. Matthew. Matthew, when we read this, you will find that in this narrative, first of all, he opened his heart. He opened his heart. He could have rejected the invitation because he's busy counting money. Do you know the tax collector is a, a deemed a traitor, a betrayer to the Jew, to the Jews? Because they are hard-earned money, but you are taxing them. And you tax them to give who? To give to the Romans. And most of these tax collectors are greedy. They tax more than is necessary. Because the system is this. If I'm the Roman boss, I said I want 20 cents. Okay? Every dollar I want 20 cents. I don't care how much you tax. So the guy will collect 30 cents, 40 cents, give Rome 20 cents, he keep the rest. He keep the balance. And so the Jewish people, they hated the tax collectors. They are not as Zacchaeus. Huh? Don't like him. But when Jesus came and called him, he opened his heart. So even as hard-hearted and unpopular you are, Jesus will come to you. And it's up to you. Matthew opened his heart. Secondly, he opened his home. And you read this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. He opened his heart home. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, Many tax collectors and sinners. Can you assume? Can you assume? Uh, okay, let me read from verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Immediately. Never asked, Who are you? You know? Where am I going? Why you call me? He arose and followed. He opened his heart. Now it happened that as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, as I mentioned just now, tax collectors, are they popular or not popular? No. Not popular. And here got many tax collectors in the house. Whose house do you think it is? It 
it is, it is likely the house of a tax collector. La. It must be Matthew's house. Ah. So, who would want to go? I mean, I mean, who would welcome a tax collector in his house? And this one is many tax collectors la, and sinners. So what scholars believe was uh, Matthew threw a party and he invited the tax collectors and, and others in. So it is called a Matthew party. <laughs> so if you hold any evangelistic meeting, call it a Matthew party, then people will come. Don't call it evangelistic. Like, so uh, frightening. Hey, I'm having a Matthew party this Friday. <laughs> Okay, so he opened his home and Jesus was there with his disciples. And what do you think Jesus did? Just eat. No, I'm sure he revealed himself to them that they too will follow him. And he opened his hand. No, people who are hard up for money, you know, hand like that one. Wow, they pull the money. But now he opened his hand. Instead of counting, he opened his hand to pen the words of the gospel for us. And Jesus chose the right person. Because a tax collector is likened to a tax accountant or what he comes. He's very detailed, very organized, very systematic. And so this, this uh, narrative that he wrote for us in 28 chapters must be something that he ordered. He placed in good order and with facts and with uh, good reference from the past to put them together. Just looking at the first five chapters, the Jew will know that this is written by a Jew and intended for him. Just reading the first five chapters. So, Jesus chose the right person who opened his heart open his home and open his head. So the same lesson for us. First you open your heart, now open your home, invite people and then open your hand. Maybe you are not a writer but open your hand to serve him. That's what he means. So I don't think I can start verse 1. <laughs> <laughs> this was set as well. So next week when we start the first one, you will be all ready. The five section, sections which I like uh, is this. The King Revealed. Chapters 1 to 10. Because uh, Matthew got to make every effort to show it to them. To present evidence. And then, chapters 11 to 13, the king resisted. You must read carefully. It's not Jesus resisted. The people resisted him. The king resisted by the people. And chapters 14 to 20, the king retreated. Chapters 21 to 27, the king rejected. Then I like chapter 28, the king resurrected. And this I'll be following closely with these sections. There's another outline if you like this. Um, I, I mean, since these this are notes, so I, I just put them and, and see which one you, you, you find useful in your own personal study. So, this is another outline. Uh, how Matthew presented Lord. Jesus Christ, the person of the King. Chapters 1 and 2, the preparation of the King. So, chapter 1 and 2 is the genealogy and then his birth, then the preparation of the King. So, it started by him being water baptized and then he went into the desert. And then the propaganda of the King. So, what we have there is... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. Chapters 9 onwards to 16, we have a program of the King. And then chapters 16, 21 until 27, we have the Passion of the King. 
So you know the movie, Passion of Christ. Anyone watch? Anyone? I, I haven't watched. I find, wow, very sad. Eh? I'm going to use a lot of tissue paper. Eh? <laughs> but I bring you to the dungeon below where Jesus was uh, chained and where he was uh, whipped and then before he was crucified. I, I think then you really feel the passion of Christ. And then the power of the King, the resurrection power of the King. Chapter 28. Okay. Um, book of the generation. So as you study this, as you study this and you look at the genealogy and so on, um, you and, and, and if you are Matthew and you're trying Try to convince convince the the Jews. Then you you say, okay, <coughs> let's look at Adam. We are all men, right? We are all men. So you look at Adam. <coughs> we got into this human race uh, in the flesh as we are. By birth, we were born into this world. But but the outcome of this is we will die. We will all die. You enter into the book of death. You look at Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as though one man, one man, who is that? Adam. Entered the world and death through sin, through the sin of disobedience, he ate the fruit. And thus death spread to all men because all sin. When God made Adam, He said it was very good. And it was meant for man to be with Him forever and ever. But through that one man, He sinned. So all of us sinned. Death spread to all men because all sin. So, what Matthew is trying to impressed upon his Jewish readers or listener is, look, you and I are sinners condemned for death. You understand? Huh? He has to start from there. He has to say, okay, so this is the problem. We are all sinners and we are condemned. So he has to bring out the solution. And the solution is found in the person of Jesus. I'm putting it very simply. Are you out with me? Okay. So trying to win over the Jewish people. So Ed, you're all from Adam. And then you got in by birth. And then you end up in the book of death. But, but, there is Jesus. And you get in by a new birth. You must be what? Born again. And when you do, it is not the book of death, but Lamb's book of life. You see the difference. So, you if you offer something that they already know, and there is no change, what news is that? But what I'm telling you is, whatever you have is bad news. I've got the good news for you. This is better than what you have. And this is through the person of Jesus. And you must get in by the new birth so that you will be in the Lamb's book of life. So John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, and you know who he said to, right? Nicodemus. Unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you are born again. This is a spiritual birth. The first birth is your physical birth. So, this is uh, Matthew's approach even to address these Jewish people. So I will stop here.
And next week we will start with chapter 1. So Father, we thank you so much for this word preserved for us. And even as you have targeted this book to the Jews, Lord, it is also for us. Because we are also descendants of Abraham. We are also are beneficiaries of the blessed hope, the promises. And surely, Lord, we take heed of all that you have written and taught unto us, and that we will continue in our sojourn here on earth, purposefully and meaningfully and relevantly, and being of use and service unto you. So as the weeks go by, we pray that you will continue to teach us that we can be of great use for you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.